Namo itasa bhagavato arahato sama sambodhasa. Namo itasa bhagavato arahato sama sambodhasa. Namo itasa bhagavato arahato sama sambodhasa. Bodhang dhammang sankhang namasami. So I'm here in the temple at Amarawati on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, and this is uh, one of the uh, traditional Sunday afternoon talks. This is the first one I've given for a very long time. And I have to say I'm feeling a little bit anxious because uh, I have this longing to give a, a really good talk <laughs> that will be very helpful and inspiring and support people well on their journey to liberation. And I think I'm a little bit anxious that it might not happen. Uh, so that's an interesting thing to notice. Uh, the subject of the talk is understanding refuge, which is a, a topic that I, I really love. Um, because having uh, come across this teaching over 40 years ago and been practicing as a nun in this community for a very long time, uh, I see that the, the refuges is a really um, fundamental uh, to our practice and fundamental to uh, in that they offer a possibility of living uh, in a wise and skillful and compassionate way uh, on the planet, living out our lives in a good way. Um, so I was, I, I've always been very interested in the refuges. Um, what I'm anticipating that I'll do is talk about refuge in a very general way to start with, my understanding of what a, what a refuge is, and then to, to take it deeper and deeper until we see how it actually works on the level of, of the mind, of the heart, how it can really, really help us uh, in our lives. So considering what a refuge is, what is a refuge? A refuge is a, a place of safety, uh, something we can rely on. And uh, my sense is that these last few months have really um, brought us to the point of, of needing to understand what this means. Um, because things are changing very, fa very fast in the society where we live, um, throughout the world. You know, since early March, uh, things have changed beyond what one could ever have anticipated uh, because of the pandemic, the, the COVID virus that's um, affected so many millions of people over the planet. Nobody is spared. And uh, obviously there have been measures put in place to, to try as far as possible to protect people um, from becoming infected, uh, to ensure that the people who are infected are properly cared for. Um, a, lot of, a lot of effort, a lot of thought has, been, has gone into uh, protecting the people of the world. And each government has... Uh, applied themselves to, to try and come up with the, uh, the best solution that will be least damaging uh, to people's livelihoods. Um, so it's been a very, a very uncertain time. And all of the things that uh, people have been used to relying on um, have been proven to not be quite so reliable. Uh, you know, having you know, their personal wealth, their good health, their friends, their relations, their jobs, their um, places of worship even. You know, nowadays, 
people can can't really come to Amarawati very much, just 30 people uh, for a very brief few hours uh, can come here and just be in certain very restricted parts of the monastery. So they can't even come into this lovely temple to, to sit quietly and to find that, that uh, environment where the, where the heart can settle more easily. Um, so it's, a very, it's been a very challenging, very difficult time, I think, for a great many people. So when I was thinking about refuge, one of the first memories that came to mind was of a tudong, like a, a walk that I did some years ago with, well, she was then Ajahn Kovida. She was a nun in our community for many years. And we were walking in Scotland, setting off from Milntume Hermitage where I live, and uh, just going to spend four days doing a, a walk and uh, the first part of the walk was along a, a footpath to a place called Calendar. And there was a river uh, on, on, on the, uh, we had to cross. And the first time I'd done this walk, we'd been able to cross with stepping stones. And the second time we'd done this walk, um, we'd found a, a walkway. Um, so I was fairly confident that although the bridge was washed away in 2002 and uh, although it was on the list of high priority it hadn't actually been repaired yet this was 2014 I think so <laughs> it uh, things happen can happen quite slowly up there sometimes uh, anyway so so we we were walking and just as we got close to the river it had been quite a nice day and and this incredible thunder and lightning storm began. I mean, really, really serious storm with lots of lightning, lots of thunder, and really heavy rain, really heavy rain. So fortunately, it was just the start of our walk, so we were still feeling quite optimistic. So we got out our rain ponchos and put them on and put our back backpacks back on again and uh, found the uh, the walkway and walked across and blow me if the road has just wasn't there anymore the path on the other side and there were these mountains of mud um, just mountains of mud like when they're doing well they were doing construction actually <laughs> you know sometimes you see on the motorways these mountains of mud as part of the construction process so we were stumbling over these mountains of mud and still the rain was coming down, still we were getting wetter and wetter and uh, slipping and sliding on this mud. Not quite sure where we were going, but anyway. And suddenly behind us, we heard this voice saying, make for the huts, make for the huts. Uh, we looked around and there was one of the workers in a, in a kind of works vehicle driving over the mountains of mud. So we were quite far ahead of him. So we saw in the distance some, some huts and uh, still pouring with rain, slipping and sliding, mud everywhere, water everywhere. And eventually we found this hut, this workman's hut. And we uh, got there just at the same time that the construction worker got there. And we all landed up in the hut, kind of panting, steaming, uh, looking at each other in amazement. <laughs> he was Irish, and he couldn't quite believe what he saw, the, the two of us with our shaven heads, absolutely drenched in our ponchos, quite bright and cheerful. But there we were in the hut, sheltering from the rain. That really felt like, like a refuge, a place of safety. Uh, just to get out of the rain, out of the elements. Um, and as sometimes happens in Scotland, and it happens here too, 
um, we can have tremendous rainstorms and then a few hours later or a short time later then the sun comes out. So we waited in the hut and eventually the sun came out and we continued on our walk. At the end of the walk, after a very long day of walking, we, um, we had arranged to meet some people and we met them and they took us to their home. And I remember, I remember having a bath. <laughs> and that's, that was a, another kind of refuge. And it's the refuge of being out of the elements, being protected, being safe. And then this wonderful hot bath after four days of pretty strenuous walking, some difficult situations along the way, a lot of uncertainty and problems and things, um, which is what you expect on Tudong. You expect the unexpected. We met a, a traveling circus at one point. <laughs> that was interesting. Anyway, just lying there in the bath and just a sort of feeling of just being held. Uh, lovely, deep, warm water, and just the feeling of not having to do anything, just being able to rest. So I'm, I'm interested in contemplating refuge as a place of safety, and as a place where we can rest, where we can put down our, our concerns, our worries, this sense of, of being, being looked after, being nurtured, being cared for. Um, those, of course, are, are physical refuges that I've described. And uh, many of you will probably have experience of uh, finding places of safety. And there are places that are called refuges for people who've um, seeking refuge from like domestic violence or some kind of really difficult situation, a place that's set up to provide that kind of care, that kind of safety. And of course, all the, the refugees on the planet, people who are fleeing from places of real mortal danger and losing all of the, all of the securities of their lives fleeing, often in terrible, dangerous circumstances, uh, trying to find a place, trying to find a country that will receive them, that will provide them with some kind of place where they can live without the, uh, the fear of either themselves or their, their dear ones uh, being slaughtered or tortured or uh, suffering some kind of other terrible, difficult, situation. Mm. So this, this word refuge, it, it carries some very, very powerful meanings for us. And then in Buddhism, we have what we call the three refuges. The triple gem is another way it's described, the three jewels. And um, I'm interested in all, all three of these kind of labels because they each give a, a different sense, uh, a different angle on the, on the significance of uh, these um, things, these refuges, a refuge, a place of safety, uh, a gem, something that is very uh, indestructible uh, very beautiful, can't be harmed, uh, and a jewel, something of, of great value, and also of beauty, of course. And as Buddhists, we, we chant Buddhang Saranangachami, Dhammang Saranangachami, Sangang Saranangachami. To the Buddha, I go for refuge. To the Dhamma, I go for refuge. To the Sangha, I go for refuge. And this is something that, you know, traditionally, uh, those who are practicing as Buddhists will repeat very frequently. Yeah. For us in, in the monastery, uh, normally, under normal circumstances, we have 
you know, pujas every morning, every evening, and we uh, pay respects. We we um, recollect these refuges, Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Uh, when we determine our precepts, uh, we bring to mind the refuges three times. Buddhang Sarananga Chami Den Dutiyampi Tatiyampi. So it's something we say very frequently. And like all things that we say very frequently, it can, be, it can become a habit and we can do it just automatically uh, without really uh, reflecting on, on what it can mean for us in our lives. And when we first start off in our practice, we, we hear about these refuges and uh, we read about them and we think, oh yes, very nice, that sounds good. <laughs> and uh, we, we also chant the, the, the qualities of each of the refuges. Yeah, a whole list of, of qualities, yeah, like the Buddha, the uh, fully enlightened, absolutely pure, uh, free from any kind of selfishness. Uh, perfectly wise, perfectly compassionate, perfectly free. Um, the Dhamma, the, the truth, apparent here and now, timeless, um, everywhere, uh, something we can taste, that we can know for ourselves. And uh, Sangha, the, those who practice, the Ujjupatipano, uh, Nyaya Patipano, Samiji Patipano, and so on, the, practicing with uh, integrity, with sincerity, practicing properly with insight, with understanding directly. You know, we recite these qualities. And uh, it's good that we do this. It's good. And it's good that it's kind of there at the tip of our tongue to recite, to remember, to recollect. Um, And for me, it's also about really taking it deeper. Um, it was many years ago when I was on a retreat with Ajahn Viradamo at a very strange place in Northumberland called Headsnook Hall. And I uh, was on this retreat and he was talking about refuge in Dhamma and during his talk and during walking meditation afterwards, I began to get a little sense of what that really meant and what it really is to go for refuge in Dhamma, take refuge in Dhamma. And I have to say it was awesome. And I mean that in the kind of traditional sense of the word. It brought a sense of awe, a sense of, wow. Um, because I'd been brought up, as I imagine all of you were brought up, to really uh, trust in your brain, in your thinking mind, your intelligence, your capacity for analytical thinking, sort of thinking things out, uh, making plans, uh, communicating, um, knowing what's what, having a program, having some kind of a structure that you, you're going to follow, um, agreements. Uh, and uh, you know, for many people, uh, like the way that we offer teachings is, is quite mind-blowing because <laughs> we don't actually have, well, we're encouraged to, to not use those structures. So um, you know, rather than writing out our talk beforehand, writing all exactly what we're going to say, uh, what, what is encouraged is to just trust in the Dhamma. 
And if you're used to thinking things out, if you've got a good mind, you know, a clever mind can uh, work things out, can figure out how to explain things in a good way, uh, the idea of not using that mind, not, not, not planning in that way is, is uh, it seems like a kind of madness. Uh, those of you who've had a chance to, to go on retreat will have probably had a chance to observe your clever thinking mind. <laughs> and you know, you hear a few Dhamma talks and then you start giving yourself Dhamma talks. <laughs> and the mind you know, thinks, you know, like if, 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 if it's planned that there's going to be a sharing at the end of the retreat, you know, you can find, feel yourself sort of thinking out exactly what you're going to say, how you're going to say it, how you can put it that's going to be really, really good. And, uh, uh, but when we take refuge in Dhamma, we, we don't, we don't do that. We don't, we don't rely on our thinking mind. There's a, there's a, deeper level of trust. So the Buddha's teachings, which is what we also, well, the, yeah, the Buddha's teachings is, is, is referred to as the Dhamma, and there's uh, many volumes in the library of, of teachings that were memorized by the uh, different um, disciples um, over hundreds of years, these these um, teachings were, were memorized and were, were passed down. It was an oral tradition. So people would gather around and somebody who'd learnt a particular uh, collection of teachings would recite them. You know, like, so for us in our community here, we, we recite the Dhamma Chaka Sutta, like the setting in motion of the wheel of Dhamma, and Atalakana Sutta, the discourse on, on not-self. Uh, the fire sermon, you know, we, we learn these teachings off by heart and recite them and it's a really lovely thing to do together. We do that. But when you look at the Buddhist scriptures and you realize that every single word was remembered and passed down uh, and just think of how many people or how, what an incredible in retentive mind they must have had uh, to be able to, to do that. Phenomenal. Anyway, these teachings, they were all written down and every one of them was pointing to the truth. They were Dhamma teachings pointing to the truth. When the Buddha was first enlightened, when he described his enlightenment, what he said was I, that he rediscovered a truth. He discovered a pathway, like a pathway through a forest. And during his life, he, he taught, he pointed out this pathway to countless individuals so that they themselves could, could walk along this path. They could, they could discover for themselves the Dhamma, the middle way. So we say of the Dhamma that it's apparent here and now. Now right here, each one of us can can taste the Dhamma for ourselves, can experience it for ourselves directly. And that experience is different from our intellectual understanding. The intellectual understanding is certainly a very helpful refuge um, because if we're in a very difficult situation, just being able to recite it to remind ourselves that there is this um, refuge, that there's this resource uh, can be very helpful. But the actual going for refuge, the actual taking refuge means that we, we establish presence. That's basically it. We're fully present with things as they are. This is what mindfulness is, just being fully present. What I've found in my own practice is that that's actually what something I can trust. You know, I can have all kinds of wonderful ideas. I've had lots of wonderful ideas in my life, some very good ideas. But um, 
usually if that's what I follow, or often if that's what I follow, um, it's not always the best, there's not always the best result. You know, what, what, I, what I like best is being able to actually allow myself to not know and to really trust in this capacity that each one of us has. The capacity to, to see clearly, like the Buddha, is that which sees clearly, that which knows, which understands things as they are. The Dhamma, the, the truth, as we experience it moment by moment. The Sangha, uh, both the community, also our, I like to see it kind of as our faith, our faith, our aspiration to live in accordance with this truth. So that our practice goes from an intellectual understanding to an understanding of the heart. It sinks right into our bones, in fact. It just becomes part of us. Of course, it doesn't happen straight away. We might just have a glimmer of that possibility that each one of us has. And then over time, over repeated application, repeated practice, we begin to see, yes, this really works. We begin to see the, the benefit of going for refuge in this way. We begin to trust that present moment awareness far more than our ideas about things, about what thing, how things are, how things should be. If we have an idea about how something should be, that's a very insecure kind of refuge, isn't it? <laughs> because things don't always work out. You know, as we've discovered over these last weeks and months, you know, things, things don't always work out. And if we were putting a lot of um, effort, a lot of hope, placing a lot of importance in things being a certain way, then when they don't work out, that can be very frustrating, very disappointing, very upsetting. And if we're not careful, we find ourselves blaming ourselves or blaming somebody else or you know, just finding somebody to blame. Almost as though that would make us feel better. But it doesn't really, does it? Maybe for a little while you think it's their fault. <laughs> they should be punished. Uh, but that's a very unsatisfactory kind of um, response. When we can really establish presence in a situation, what happens in the heart is a a really a very profound kind of settling, a kind of a, a fullness, a kind of peacefulness, a sense of ease, a sort of, yeah, of course. Like as I said at the beginning, just like lying in a hot bath, yes, of course. Ah, <laughs> don't have to worry. You know, things will be taken care of. This doesn't mean that we don't have to be mindful don't have to be aware, because the refuge in Buddha means being aware. Like the Buddha, like buddho, the word buddho actually just means awake. <laughs> you know, sometimes we think it means something really celestial and sort of miraculous and wonderful, but buddho means awake, an awakened one. And in the time of the Buddha, there were, there were many, um, you know, it was quite a common um, idea like the possibility of an awakened being. And so when he you know, attained to complete enlightenment, complete perfect understanding, you know, and, and he uh, uh, was acknowledged as a, as a fully enlightened Buddha, that, that wasn't a particularly strange thing in those, in those times. He was awake, alert, attentive.
But this alertness, this attentiveness, was also accompanied by a kind of ease. Because the Buddha didn't worry about things. <laughs> uh, obviously, there was a heart of compassion. And there are many, many uh, accounts of interactions that he had with different people, different situations that arose during his life. You know, he spent 45 years after his enlightenment uh, guiding and teaching and just really uh, dedicating his life um, uh, for the welfare of others, uh, establishing a monastic community, you know, groups of, of um, men and later on women who, who, who joined, the Samana sang, Sangha, you know, those who, 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 who um, decided to live, follow a life of renunciation, of simplicity. Um, and then vast numbers of, of, of lay people who would provide the material support for the monks and nuns. And they, in their turn, would provide um, encouragement, spiritual encouragement um, to the lay people to realize their potential for liberation. Um, so he encountered many different situations, and some of them quite challenging. And uh, it's quite entertaining to read some of the accounts of, of dialogues that he had. You know, sometimes, you know, incredible um, skill, immense compassion, kindness in his response. Other times, a very, a very sharp wit. <laughs> There's one story about Satchika, who came and challenged him about an aspect of his doctrine, and he led him through this debate. Uh, and in quite a short time, he, he uh, uh, tied him completely up in knots. And uh, it's very, you know, I can't remember which sutta it is, but somewhere in the, in the middle length sayings. So a whole range of responses. So it wasn't that he had a kind of set prearranged pattern, but in a way he demonstrated very clearly um, how it is uh, to live with mindfulness, to live with awareness, um, awake, alert, attentive, responsive, attuned to Dhamma, attuned to this moment. And yet, at the same time, with a very uh, clear um, ethical uh, foundation. And this is part of uh, what happens for an enlightened being. We were hearing the other week from Ajahn Amaru, that an enlightened being, an arahant, you know, can't do anything immoral. You know, it's just, it's, it's impossible. They can't do anything that uh, can cause harm to anybody else, that takes advantage of anybody else in any way at all. Um, so it is cultivating this, this skill. I think for many of us, when we start practice, we can um, fall into the difficulty of overstraining. Uh, I think certainly uh, in the culture that I've grown up in, uh, there's a tremendous fear of failure. You know, really frightened of failing in our exams. Or, I mean, I, I used to kind of worry whether I would actually make it as a human being. <laughs> you know, but just thinking, I, I don't think I've got what it takes to be a human being, to, 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 to live uh, as, a, as, an, as an adult on this planet. You know, just, as, just this terrific kind of fear of not being good enough, not being okay. And uh, we, can, we can bring this to our practice, this fear that we're, we're not going to be okay, we're not going to do well enough. And it's interesting, I mean, I spent years kind of uh, swinging from trying far too hard, overstraining, and then feeling really disappointed because the mind would be strained and struggling. And no, no, not a moment's peace. Uh, and then go to the other extreme of just falling asleep because, you know, I just, I thought, I can't do this, it's beyond me. I can't do this practice. 
Um, I remember one time thinking, well, you know, it'd be much better for the Sangha if they, if, if they just threw me out, if I just left. <laughs> I'm such a burden, such a hopeless case. You know, we can have these really weird ideas. And I just, I thought, actually, come on, Chandasiri, you love this life. You don't want to leave. I thought, well, okay. Well, if they want to get rid of me, they'll have to throw me out. <laughs> and uh, so far they haven't. But this feeling of, of fear of failing, of overstraining, uh, struggling, a lot of emphasis, uh, or there can be a lot of emphasis on concentration, concentrating the mind, which can bring a very kind of tight uh, feeling in the mind. We might be able to, through an um, effort of will, uh, suppress all of the, um, the unskillful thinking or planning or restlessness or doubt or whatever. We, c we might be able, I mean, there are people who can actually make their mind very quiet through an effort of will. But um, there's no ease there. And at the other extreme, if you're too easy, too relaxed, then that's not, that's not right either. So this um, is learning how to um, observe, how to notice, how is it? So when I try to offer encouragement and guidance to people nowadays, rather than you know, pointing too much to trying to get a particular result, you know, sort of getting the, sort of the jhana factors going and going through these blissful states, uh, and being all that concerned about that, um, I was happy to realize that actually um, it's more helpful for many people and more helpful I've found in my own practice to just ask, how is it right now? What can I know right now? And this is really a, an invitation to go for refuge. How is it right now? Taking refuge in the Buddha, that which knows, that which sees clearly, that recognizes, okay, right now, my body feels like this. So right now I'm sitting here in this temple and I'm aware of the, um, quite a nice cushion here on this big fancy seat, nice mat. Um, I'm aware that the temple is much more spacious than it has been in the past. It normally is. I've kind of got used to it now. I've been back here for a few months and I've got used to having a couple of meters between each mat, people spaced, spaced out. It's nice actually. So I'm noticing the feeling of spaciousness in the temple. Um, I'm noticing how my body feels. And when I remember, I'm noticing how I'm breathing. And and how it feels to be to be sharing these these ideas. And these are things that that I can notice, and for all of you, wherever you may be. These are, these are the kind of things that you can notice. Just notice how the body is, how the breath is. If you're feeling a bit hungry or a bit thirsty or a bit restless, you can also notice what your mind is doing. This is really important. I call it mind reading, <laughs> reading your own mind. Uh, the Buddha knows the Dhamma, it knows the mind, it knows the body as it is right now. So this is where the idea of going for refuge becomes really interesting. Because, I mean, I think everybody's, many people will have heard of the idea of the law of kama. You know, that we, if we act or speech or speak with a, a skillful, a wholesome intention, with thoughts of kindness, thoughts of compassion, 
sorts of generosity of renunciation, um, such action or speech um, is beneficial. It benefits us and it benefits those around us. Whereas if we act or speak uh, with an unwholesome state of mind, thoughts of ill will or cruelty, harmful thoughts or greed, lust, if, the, if we follow those kind of intentions, there may be a, a temporary gratification, but then when we sit quietly, you know, if we have a moment to, to be quietly with ourselves, usually we don't feel so good. That's certainly been my experience. If I say something mean, sometimes even if I look at somebody in a mean way, <laughs> I, can, I can think, oh dear, <laughs> I didn't need to. I didn't need to glower at that person, especially if I think that they've they've noticed. You know, if I've sensed that I've actually hurt somebody, then it's it's like hurting yourself. So over time, you know, when we live according to the precepts, uh, there comes a, a real uh, inclination to avoid causing harm or difficulty to anybody, to take advantage or hurt anybody, and to exploit anybody for our own uh, gratification. So this uh, refuge in Buddha enables us to, to check out the kind of thoughts that we're ha having. This might sound a little bit strange to some of you. It took me a long time to realize that I could notice what I was thinking because often we're so identified with our thoughts. There's, there's no real sense of separation. You know, you think that, you know, your thoughts are you. Um, but when we start medita meditating, when we start um, observing, noticing, uh, we begin to see that there's this thing just chattering away inside our heads. And a lot of it's complete rubbish. <laughs> Some of it's uh, very exciting, very interesting, very wonderful. Uh, some of it's quite lovely, quite beautiful. And some of it can be quite harmful. And sometimes it can take a bit of time to actually appreciate uh, the harmfulness of, of some of our patterns of thinking. So taking refuge in Buddha is about observing the thinking rather than just believing it or following it. So we're aware of what we're thinking, aware of how we're feeling. We're able to notice if we're feeling really upset. So our Buddhist practice, I mean, some people say, well, Buddhists, of course, are calm and peaceful and loving and generous and compassionate. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, if you get a bit upset, they said, well, I thought you were a Buddhist. You, should, you shouldn't be angry. You shouldn't be upset. Um, but actually, Buddhists are just like everybody else. We're Buddhists are, are human beings. Um, and like everybody else, you know, we do experience anger sometimes. We do experience frustration. We do. Um, sometimes we don't like everybody. We get irritated by other people. Even as a nun, you know, I've been a nun for, you know, more than 40 years. <laughs> I was a novice in 1979, so 41 years. A um, long time, but I can still, you know, feel angry, upset. I don't, I don't always uh, feel calm and peaceful and loving and generous and all of that. I remember when early, early days at Chithurst, uh, there were four of us novices. We all started at the same time. And uh, we were definitely not calm and peaceful all the time inside. We were, yeah, so we, we, we you know, we, we, we um, it was, it was difficult. We all, we all used to, we, we, we were the cooks, the main cooks. Ajahn Sumedha wanted us to, to do cooking. I think partly because we were, we were quite good at cooking. <laughs> But we, did, we never had very much to cook in those days. 
the food was rather simple. So if, if somebody brought, say, a block of, of cheese, and if you were going to be cooking the next day, and if you knew, knew there was this block of cheese in the larder, you know, the evening puja would be full of thinking about what you were going to do with this block of cheese. And if it so happened that the person you were going to be cooking with the next day also had ideas about the block of cheese, different ideas from yours, there could be some very interesting moments. Uh, but we never came to blows. And people used to come and visit. And they, 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 they'd walk into the kitchen sometimes when we were preparing the meal and they'd say, oh, you look so calm and peaceful. <laughs> and we'd just laugh. <laughs> And I thought about that, and what I realized was that um, what was happening was not that the mind was calm and peaceful, but that there was an awareness. We were aware of what was going on in the mind. We were beginning to learn how to simply observe, how to go for refuge rather than following our murderous impulses. Just as well, eh? So, learning how to be aware that there's this enormous uh, rage going on inside, um, or excitement, or fear even. Just learning how to be aware that there's fear. These are all very useful skills. This is what the refuge in Buddha, refuge in Dhamma, refuge in Sangha uh, supports. Because when we take refuge in Sangha, of course, we have our precepts. We're, there's no way um, that we're going to um, harm anybody, even though we might want to. You know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a sutta where the Buddha talks about the um, ways of uh, managing uh, Distracting thoughts. This one, I can tell you, it's number 20 in the Majjhima Nikaya. In five ways. And the fifth of these is that you press the tongue against the roof of your mouth and you forcibly suppress the, uh, the thought. <laughs> so if you're feeling really, really angry and upset with somebody, rather than yelling at them or punching them in the nose or doing some other really unskillful action, you, you, you just find some way to, to not do it. So it might mean just clenching your fists, gritting your teeth like this, and just noticing, okay, right now, this is a really dangerous situation. I need to be very careful. Being able to do this with a heart of kindness is an interesting challenge. Learning how to do it with a heart of kindness, kindness towards ourselves. Not, I'm a terrible person for feeling all this rage. I shouldn't feel like this. I'm a Buddhist. I've been practicing all these years. I should be calm and peaceful and compassionate. Not that. But, Chandasiri, if you, if you let this fire out, that's going to hurt a lot of people, including you. If you want the best for yourself, you're going to hold the fire. You're going to contain the fire. And sometimes people say the, the precepts are like a, like a big furnace. You know, so the, this strong furnace and the fire can rage away, whether it's the fire of fear or hatred or anger or whatever it is, it can burn away and you just hold it. You just bear it, bear with it, just watching it. Going for refuge to the Buddha, knowing this is what's happening right now. The Dhamma, this is what's happening. This is the truth of this moment. I can observe this truth. I can be with this truth. This is how it feels. Sangha, there's no way I'm going to let this out. I'm going to contain it. I'm going to hold it. And if we can do that, not feeding it, not thinking, well, you know, it's her fault. She shouldn't have had that idea. How dare she have want to have, you know, the, the, uh, use the cheese in that way. It's my idea. I'm, gonna, I'm the head cook. I'm going to do what I want to do with the cheese, you know, whatever it might be. Um, not feeding it with our thoughts of anger, of ill will, not fanning the flames, but just letting it, letting it burn through. And little by little, it calms down. 
the fire goes out. How does that feel? We can know that also. So in this way, our refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha can be a tremendous um, support and help to us, tremendous protection. With a situation like that, what is recommended is that, um, you know, if you have been really upset about something, and if you have had to resort to this clenching the teeth <laughs> practice, what's recommended is to, to take time uh, in a quieter moment, take a bit of space to really contemplate, you know, what, what happened there? How did, how, what, how did I, why did I mind so much? And we call this wise reflection, yoniso manasikara, going to the root of, 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 the, of the difficulty, of the concern. You know, very often we get angry because we're frightened. You know, we feel that somebody's going to hurt us or take something away from us that we really value, harm us in some way or harm something that's dear to us in some way. Yeah, so we can feel really um, agitated. But when we go for refuge, we, we, we're aware of that. And then afterwards, as I said, we can take time. I often encourage people to, to go to nature. You know, so if you're fortunate enough to live near trees or in the countryside or by, by water, you know, a, a stream, a river, a pond, just uh, be with nature. That can be very calming, very soothing to the heart. Because we do need to learn how to look after the heart, you know, take care of it in a good way. So one of the things that's really um, raised up as being a very um, significant quality uh, in Buddhism, and I think probably in all of the world's religions, is um, patience. Uh, in Buddhism we call it kanti. And I say this because, you know, what I'm speaking about, um, these, these refuges um, you know, it can sound very simple. It is very simple, actually. <laughs> it's not complicated. But because of the way that we've uh, been conditioned, the way that we've lived our lives, the kind of values that we've held, not that they're necessarily particularly wrong or harmful um, or bad, but just the way that we've um, learned how to live, um, it, takes, it takes time uh, to develop um, a sense of this refuge. Um, it, it, uh, we might have a, a, you know, a, a moment of insight, think, oh, wow, amazing. But um, we may find ourselves getting caught over and over again, you know, reacting rather than responding. And something happens and we react. Uh, if, we, if somebody uh, insults us, we react, we feel angry and upset back. Uh, we insult them back. Um, something, uh, we see something that we would really like to have, and we reach out and grab it. We have a wonderful challenge here in the monastery, like as, as most of people uh, listening, I expect, will be aware, we have, well, we have breakfast and then we have one main meal 
a day. And this is a, quite a special occasion for many people, uh, particularly if you're very hungry, and quite often we're pretty hungry by the time the meal comes. And here at Amarawati, we're incredibly well supported. And so there's um, all these dishes appear on, on, a, on the servery and we walk with our bowls. We put our masks on and then we, uh, we take our arms bowls and we walk along the counter in just taking, taking food for our meal. And uh, it can be quite a challenge actually for monastics and people, people are sometimes a bit shocked when they hear about this. <laughs> Probably I shouldn't tell you, but I will. Um, that, uh, you know, we, we, we can get really excited about, say, the cakes. A few days ago, it was Ajahn Amaro's birthday, and there were all these cakes, you know, with kind of icing and nuts and chocolate and uh, even had ice cream, all these really special things. And, you know, so you, you walk along mindfully helping yourself, or hopefully mindfully helping yourself, and then you get back to your kuti where you're going to have the meal, and you look into your bowl and say, Chandasuri, you've done it again. <laughs> Taken too much. Did you have to have all those cakes? And then the next day you think, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to have so many cakes. And then you go along again, and oh, same thing happens. Takes time. <laughs> um, I have to say that after 40 years, I'm a little bit more skilled at not taking too much. But um, it's important that we don't allow ourselves to get discouraged. Um, this is really important. So, uh, just be w being willing to come back again and again and again. Uh, and if there's a feeling of, oh dear, I've had too much, uh, just to notice how that feels. Notice that voice in the mind. It could be like a like a, a parrot on your on your shoulder saying, You've had too much, you shouldn't have had so much, that's no good, done the wrong thing again, hopeless case, you'll never be any good. And um this is something that we can be aware of when we go for refuge. The Buddha can can know that this is just a parrot sitting on my shoulder, repeating the same old stuff. I don't have to believe it. I don't have to believe it. What I do sometimes is I, I, I imagine myself turning around to the parrot and saying, who says? Who says you're not good enough? So we can become a little bit playful in our practice, uh, challenging uh, the assumptions that we make, the ideas that we have, knowing that this is just the mind this is just the body. So the Buddha, that which knows, that which sees clearly, that understands the way things are, understands that everything that we experience is continuously changing. This body, this mind, is part of a flow of changing conditions that we call life. Can't hold on to any of it. The Dhamma, the truth. Just knowing this moment, this moment, this moment, as it is, changing moment by moment and sangha we could call it integrity aspiration faith living in accordance with with truth the aspiration the faith that this is possible it may take a bit of time to cultivate the habit of mindfulness if we've been cultivating the habit of heedlessness through our lives, it's going to take time to replace that with a habit of mindfulness. But we can begin now. How is it right now?
So I'm noticing that it's exactly 1600 hours. And so my sense is that it's time to end this uh, short talk. And um, you might want to have a, a few moments to stretch. If you're sitting down on the floor and feel like standing up, having a little stretch, please do so. And then we can look at some of the questions that have come in. And also I can respond to questions from the floor. If there are any questions from the floor, I love that expression. <laughs> so, thank you. So, I have a few questions. Um, This one is from Dharma Shakya. Venerable Ajahn, my apology if my question is not related to this Sunday's Dharma talk, but I shall be grateful if you could kindly answer it, please, as I have been thinking about it and trying to find the answer for many years. My question is on Vipassana meditation. I was told that the Buddha did not teach Vipassana meditation as such. He only taught right concentration, samma samadhi, and right mindfulness, samma sati. If the Buddha did not teach this, how and when did this tradition become a Buddhist meditation practice? Thank you. I haven't um, studied all of the scriptures in detail, um, but I have looked at quite a few of the instructions given by the Buddha uh, on different uh, aspects, different, yeah, di different approaches to um, our human predicament. Uh, so, obviously, in 45 years, he he, he gave a lot of teachings. And um, <clears throat> responding to different questions that people had. And I'm always really impressed at the uh, uh, skill in um, just talking about the human predicament in such a clear and relevant way. Um, it was relevant then, and it's equally relevant now. Uh, my sense was that his intention was always to, to point people to support them in understanding the nature of our human predicament. And sometimes he would encourage them to uh, contemplate uh, the, um, what we think of as the personality you know, the body, <clears throat> the different aspects of mind, form, uh, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. He would use that as a kind of analytical structure for us to uh, contemplate and to see that, in fact, the, the personality that we create out of those different elements um, is that the, there's actually no self there. There's, it's, it's not who and what we are. So you would use a kind of analytical approach to um, come to that understanding in a series of questions. Are these things permanent or impermanent? Um, are they, do, do, does, do things that call, uh, are impermanent, uh, uh, and they would answer impermanent, and he said, well, is something that's impermanent, does that bring happiness or suffering? Well, it's, it's unsatisfactory, it's unstable, it, you, we can't rely on it. And then, okay, well, in that case, you know, is it really something that we can call ourselves if it's not permanent, if it's not, if it's, it's if it's continuously changing, you know? And um, so he would use this very analytical um, strategy uh, in some situations. Other situations, he would point to the senses and how the mind is triggered uh, by different forms of contact. You know, if you see something, uh, how 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 that can can be can stimulate a, a response, or hear something, or smell something, or taste or touch something, 
you know, can either bring a kind of feeling of desire, wanting more of it, or repulsion, wanting to get rid of it. So his teaching was very, very dynamic, very fluid. And he also taught, of course, as we all know, the, like the Anapanasati, the mindfulness of breathing as a, as a technique. Um, but always in the context of this understanding on, in a much broader way. Uh, and the discourse on, on mindfulness, um, similarly. And every teaching is pointing to a different approach, a different way of understanding our human predicament. Um, so my sense is, and I, you know, I haven't studied the history of like, meditation since the time of the Buddha, the different schools, the different traditions as they've emerged and uh, been established, but my sense is that uh, different teachers who found a particular way of practice helpful and who became skilled in it would then teach that to, and people would gather around them to learn that particular technique and then it would have a name like Samatha, Vipassana and so on. So, on. Um, so I'm afraid I really uh, don't know when the Vipassana tradition became a Buddhist meditation practice. What I do know is that uh, when the Buddha was teaching, he would sometimes emphasize uh, concentration, you know, focusing the mind. He would offer strategies for focusing the mind, um, calming the mind, settling the mind. Uh, he would talk about jhana, the, the states of, of concentration, and talk about all the um, supernormal powers and things that could be developed through really developing the practice in that way. And then he would also talk about you know, day by day mindfulness and understanding and presence and awareness of change, unsatisfactoriness and impersonality. So it was all there and uh, sometimes it was called like samatha, this sort of samadhi, focusing, calming, and sometimes there'd be more emphasis on, on vipassana insight. Um, within the tradition I've uh, grown up, there seems to be a kind of, that both are encouraged, both aspects, because in a way you have to um, have a measure of calm in order to be able to observe the mind the way I've been describing. Um, you know, to be able to see, recognize the thoughts, uh, to be able to observe how they change, to stay with um, an angry feeling without following it, without struggling with it, but just recognize, okay, there is anger, there is irritation, whatever it might be that we're experiencing, or sleepiness or dullness. So, you know, you need to have a, a measure of calm um, and then to investigate, you know, to notice that it's changing, uh, to challenge, is this really me? Do I need to identify with this? Or can I just see it as a, as a thought, as a mind state? And I just recognize that this body is part of nature. You know, it, it was born and it's grown up and now it's getting old and it'll probably die fairly soon. You know, that's, that's, that's the body, that's the nature of the body. So Ajahn Chah was very um, eclectic, really, in his approach. Um, and Similarly, with Ajahn Sumedho, you know, his, his main encouragement was to trust in our own capacity for understanding, trust in awareness. So just putting us right back to the, to the refuges, to the awareness. How is it right now? What's happening right now? To learn you know, directly from our own experience and to work with that. So, um, So the, the quick answer to your question, if Buddha did not teach this, how and when did this tradition become a Buddhist meditation practice? The answer is, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, certainly I know that there, are, there is a, 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 like I think it's, it's Goenkaji, uh, evolved something called Vipassana meditation that has been taught all over the world uh, with enormous benefit. In fact, many of the people who are in our, this community here have began their meditation with, with the Vipassana style. But 
according to my understanding, Vipassana is actually much, much broader than just a, a, you know, a, a very efficacious technique. It, it covers every waking moment uh, we can be doing Vipassana, uh, present, aware, awake, alert, attentive. Um, this is Vipassana. And we can notice when the mind is focusing, when there's calm, clarity. So I hope that's kind of helpful. And now there's a whole bunch of questions. Um, and I don't know whether I can answer them either, but we'll, let's try. We'll, we'll, we'll go one by one. So, these times of political populism have aggravated social injustice and discrimination. Though movements such as Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matter, and the LGBTQ gay pride are advocating against this, advocating against the social injustice and discrimination. Were issues or concerns such as environ environmental exploitation, racism and homophobia, etc., present in the Buddha's time that he spoke about? And which of his words might we apply to address these issues today and also help us find refuge as individuals and as a society. So that's a very big question. Um, I'm sure there was, um, I'm sure that people in the time of the Buddha also had prejudices, had strong views about different things, different practices. I know there were some very weird practices, ascetic practices that people used to involve themselves, engage in. Um, so probably there were issues of uh, discrimination. There were all kinds of teachers going around in the time of the Buddha, proclaiming different truths, different ways of practice and saying, my way is the right way. My way is the best way. Follow me and you'll be all right. And uh, there's a story that I think Ajahn Amaro told a few weeks ago about the Kalamas who were getting really confused because all these people were coming and proclaiming that their way is the right way. And uh, I like that the, the way that the, the Buddha responded to that, which was, you know, basically find out for yourself. Notice, you know, if you act or speak um, or even allow yourself to um, think, you know, to feed, feed the thinking with thoughts of cruelty or ill will. If you uh, foster those, nurture those thoughts of cruelty, thoughts of ill will, thoughts of greed. Um, and then if you act or speak on those thoughts, does that bring happiness and well-being? Does it help you to feel calm and peaceful, clear or not? You know, and then when you know that actually, no, it doesn't, I, I end up feeling really confused or really upset or really angry or just makes me feel much worse, much more negative and pessimistic, then if you notice that, then okay, set those thoughts aside. You, you don't have to harbor those thoughts. If on the other hand, you have thoughts of kindness, compassion, um, renunciation, you know, how can I live more simply? How can I simplify my life? You know, how can I live in a way that, that brings more happiness in my own life and the lives of those around me? You know, if you have, you know, notice, notice how, how those kind of um, thoughts and actions, what kind of result they have. And if, if you notice that it brings a sense of calm and happiness, then, then follow that. So it's very much a kind of do-it-yourself practice. You know, try things out. We need to be very honest in this. We need to actually be, getting, be willing to look because sometimes, you know, if we think we're right um, about something, there can be a very strong sense of I'm right and they're wrong. So even if we're right about something that is very, um, you know, appropriate, I, I used to get really confused, um, you know, in my teens and twenties about like the peace movement because banning the bomb and all of that you know, because I completely agreed with what people were pointing to and talking about, you know, I was very um, concerned. But 
I wasn't at all attracted to going on a march or um, to being around these people because they felt really angry. <laughs> they, they didn't feel very peaceful at all. You know, they were angry, they were upset, they wanted to hurt and blame and judge um, the government or, or whatever. So um, we do need to be have, have, have a, a kind of a real sort of, sort of honesty and integrity um, when, we, when we look into this. You know, how does it feel to, to, to grab a, a banner, to grab a position? Um, now, I'm not saying that any kind of demonstration is wrong or any, you know, that all banners are wrong, but how are you holding it? Are you able to hold it lightly, you know, because you, you want to point out something that's inappropriate that's happening in the society? You want to say, look, this is, this is wrong. You know, you're hurting people. This is not fair. You know, can you do that with a peaceful heart? And if you can, then go for it. But if you're getting angry and enraged and upset, you're just producing more of the same. Fear, rage, division, harm, harmful. It's, you know, it can be very harmful, even if you're right. <laughs> so be careful with that. Uh, There's a very, um, very nice little book of the um, Buddha's teachings called the Dhammapada. In fact, I had a copy. I almost brought it because I was uh, thought I might find an occasion to read from it. And but if you come across a copy, look at the first two verses um, because they're very, very telling. Uh, if you act or speak with a mind of uh, filled with unwholesome uh, states, then unhappiness will follow, like the cart wheel follows the hoof print of the ox that draws it, something like that. There's a kind of inevitability, um, you know, if you act or speak in those ways, that it, it won't bring a very happy result. Whereas if you act or speak with a, um, a wholesome intention, then happiness will follow like your never departing shadow. So you always feel a sense of brightness and lightness and joy. And that, that, that can spread. So um, I hope that helps. And then your next question. <laughs> some say some of the Buddhist atti Buddha's attitudes were of his time and were misogynist. Can you see any evidence of this? So, like, the Buddha didn't like women, you mean? <laughs> um, no, actually. Um, I think if you look deeply into the scriptures, uh, you'll, uh, some of the teachings, I mean, there are some uh, teachings that I would be very careful who I shared them with, um, but if you look at the actual context of them um, and consider who he was speaking to, um, you realize that it wasn't that the Buddha um, didn't like women or thought that women were bad or didn't have any respect for women, but it was more um, that an appreciation of the power of attraction, you know, sexual attraction. And if he was speaking to monks who were living a celibate life, then um, sometimes it would be helpful uh, to point out that you know, our physical forms are not so uh, beautiful as we might imagine. Uh, I mean, certainly there's enormous pleasure to be had through, through um, sexuality, but it doesn't uh, ultimately, it's not ultimately satisfying, it doesn't ultimately lead to peace. Um, but can rather lead to confusion, lead to the opposite, lead to wanting more. And so as a way of training, um, guiding his, his close disciples, his renunciant disciples, he would sometimes speak um, in ways that you know, could appear quite shocking about women. Um, on the other hand, if you, if you look into other aspects of the teachings, 
you see that actually he had a tremendous uh, respect uh, for women, for women's practice, uh, for women's predicament, um, and you know, enormous um, interest in, in supporting, helping. Um, so, I don't think the Buddha disliked women <laughs> at all, but I think he certainly um, recognized the, the power um, of, of that, one could almost say like animal level of attraction and sort of procreation, uh, which is uh, how, how, uh, how we've come to survive for as long as we have. Um, and for those who choose to um, follow a path of renunciation, follow the um, monastic style of practice and to renounce that, um, sometimes you know, some pretty strong encouragement is needed because you know, it can be a very uh, powerful pull. So you need to be careful not to take the teachings out of context because you could end up thinking that he was a real woman hater, but I'm, I have other evidence uh, that that uh, wasn't, wasn't the case. Um, we could get into a very political discussion here, and I, I think I'd rather not do that right now, but um, so I'd, li I'd like to carry on with the other questions and see if anything else arises when I get to the end. Um, I'm afraid the questions might not be in the right order because I had trouble with the printer. So this is, um, oh, maybe, yeah. Were there any differences in Buddha's teachings for lay people between men and women, as well as transgender and non-binary people? Um, mostly not. Mostly the teachings were exactly the same for everybody. Um, there's one sutta where the Buddha talks about, in, in the Diganikaya, where the Buddha talks about um, how to, uh, duties of the teacher to the pupil, the pupil to the teacher, the um, master to the servant, the servant to the master, the husband to the wife, and the wife to the husband. And uh, they were very much um, a, a response to the way that people lived in those days. Uh, just a list of you know, five or six guidelines for how um, women should treat their husbands and husbands should treat their wives. So the husband should provide the wife with adornments. <laughs> and I actually can't remember all the other things. And the wife should uh, run the household as best she can. I think that was something like that. It's interesting to look at because you get a very clear sense of how a certain class of people would have lived in the time of the Buddha. But I, we'd prob he'd probably come up with a different list of um, uh, suggested guidelines for nowadays. But those guidelines were basically about having a, a respect and a care for each other and supporting each other in their lives and their specific roles according to the society. But all of the other teachings pointing to, you know, old age, sickness, death, we have these bodies that are going to get old, that are going to get sick, that are going to die, whether you're a man or a woman, a binary, non-binary, transgender, whatever, these bodies are going to change. Uh, this is part of life. This is something we can reflect upon. And we can use the opportunity of this human existence to do a lot of good. If we, if we wish, we can actually choose to do a lot of good. Or, or not. Uh, and that's, that's the same for everybody. That's what I found in my fairly limited explorations of the Buddhist scriptures, both the, um, the suttas and also in the um, discourses to the um, monks and nuns and the guidance for them. 
Uh, that was mostly it. And where can lay people new to Buddhism gradually learn about how to find refuge practically and learn to start walking the Eightfold Path consistently every day? Golly. Reading that, it sounds like a very tall order. And how can any of us uh, uh, find refuge practically and walk the Eightfold Path consistently day by day? Uh, what comes to mind is a story of, of one of the monks in the very early days. Well, not the very early days. In the very early days, the, um, f there were no rules for the monastic community. Um, all of the people who were attracted to the Buddha's teachings, they were all very highly realized beings already and didn't make mistakes, or so it would seem. Um, and it was only after some years uh, that the Buddha had been uh, guiding uh, the community that mistakes began to be made. And the rules began to be formed in response to each of the mistakes, each of the difficulties. And there's a, a little story of one monk. I think by this time there were 150 rules, quite a lot of rules. And this one monk, he went to the Buddha and he said, Lord, how on earth am I going to remember 150 rules? I can't possibly remember all that. And so the Buddha said, well, could you manage three? And he said, well, yes, I can manage three. So the Buddha gave these three uh, guidelines, which is basically a, a sort of condensed version of the Eightfold Path. So sila, samadhi, panya. Sila is ethics, so right speech, right action, right livelihood. So am I careful about um, how I live? You know, do I live in a way that uh, promotes well-being in others, that helps, is, that's helpful, that's kind, that's supportive? Um, do I avoid harming myself through uh, inappropriate activities, taking substances that maybe, that maybe cause harm? Um, am I careful about how I live my life, is basically what that means. My livelihood. Do I, as far as possible, earn my living uh, in a way that doesn't exploit or harm others. So that's sila. When we live carefully and responsibly, then when we sit quietly, the mind can settle. And I was saying earlier how if times that I've hurt somebody, my mind is quite agitated. I'm disturbed, there's a sense of regret or remorse. Whereas if I'm careful, the mind settles. And Venerable Ananda once asked, you know, what are the benefits of, of sila? And the Buddha said, you can live without regret. You're living carefully, doing your best to avoid harming or taking advantage of others. When the mind is calm and settled, then you can see into the nature of the mind, how the mind works. You can understand how greed, how hatred, how delusion uh, disturb the mind, cause problems. You can understand how the opposite of those, and generosity, um, kindness, care, uh, promote well-being. Be the, begin to understand the, the nature of suffering. Uh, and so this is panya, this is the arising of understanding, discernment, wisdom. So I would say that if it's a lay person who's new to Buddhism, who maybe is not particularly interested in Buddhism, you can still talk about ethics, you can still talk about living carefully and responsibly uh, in relation to yourself, in relation to others. You can still talk about how this um, makes you feel good, you feel better when you do that. Don't have a lot of regret, um, guilt, shame and how in that way uh, the mind is more settled, 
and you can actually begin to see that these bodies are getting older all the time. Things are changing all the time. Yesterday you were glum, today you're cheerful. Just like the weather here in, in England, it's continuously changing. And in the same way, the mind is constantly changing. So you can use those kind of similes. Uh, you don't have to use Buddhist language um, necessarily. So I hardly ever, like when, when I'm when I'm living up in when I'm up in Comrie near where I where I live you know I meet a lot of people and um, most of them aren't Buddhist most of them aren't at all interested in Buddhism uh, but you know you can find ways of talking um, relating to their lives relating to their difficulties and concerns uh, that kind of bring Buddhist ideas in um, just because that's the way that's the way we think <laughs> it's it's not that it's not 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 anything particularly special it's just how we think how we've trained ourselves so um fortunately we're not trying to convert people you know the, 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 we're, in fact we're not even allowed to teach unless we're invited so it's a matter of like embodying the teachings as best we can you know being kind being generous being supportive of not, not, not gossiping, not, not using harsh or abusive speech, just how we live our lives, how we manage our own lives and um, relationships. That's often the best teaching. You know, are we happy? Uh, so a few, a few pointers. So these are two very specifically about Amrawati. These are challenging times, yes, with COVID-19, Brexit, and a predicted, unprecedented economic recession on the horizon, affecting the UK, Thailand, and globally. In the short term, the mid term, and the long term, could Amarawati's and the Thai forest tradition's very existence be put at risk by a lack of dana contributions and these challenges? Don't know. I suppose so. Don't know. And you know what? I'm not going to worry about that. Maybe you think that's irresponsible, but I think I'm not going to worry about that. I do feel um, a concern um, for, for people who are suffering real hardship and for people who are likely to suffer real hardship as a result of these things that you speak about. Um, and obviously, you know, I think all of us here will do whatever we can, uh, both to um, liberate our own heart from, from suffering, uh, understand the suffering of our own lives, and also to share that understanding with others. This is what we, what we can do. And hopefully um, there'll come a stage when we can welcome people to come and spend time here um, and uh, to use this physical place as, as a, a more a less reliable refuge, but a place where, where people can, can come again and be part of the larger community. Um, so very, it's a very real, very important question. But as I said, I, there's too many things to worry about. And I don't know if you've noticed, but worry doesn't really bring a state of happiness and joy. Worry just seems to lead to more worry. That's been my experience. And so when I can recognize it on the horizon and think, I'm not going to worry about that, then uh, I find I feel much better. And it's not because I don't care, but it's just that um, when the time comes, then I will respond as skillfully as I can to whatever the situation might be. Um, so this is because I, I trust the refuges more than my thinking mind. Um, and I, I trust that I will have the capacity to respond in a good way when, when the time comes. Um, so, 
another couple of questions. A very active mind here. This is all, all the same person. <laughs> How can Amarawati support and advocate for a deeper understanding of Buddha's refuge locally and globally during these times? With both our leaders and with each of us individually, including non-Buddhists. Well, I think I've kind of been answering that um, all along. Um, I've never met any of our leaders, um, and I'm not sure what I would say to them if I met them, whether I'd have anything to say. You know what, I'd probably just relax and uh, try to meet them where they are. Um, I don't envy our leaders. I don't envy any leaders in the world because I think they have a, an extremely difficult job, enormous responsibility, and um, I can see that it's, it's, it's really not easy for them. And if they're greedy and selfish and um, not wise, then I think it's even more difficult. And um, so basically I, I, I wish them well and I wish also for them that uh, a sense of inner calm and balance that can um, support them in making wise decisions and living unselfishly uh, for the welfare of, of all beings. We have a very um, lovely chant that you may be familiar with, uh, the sharing of our blessings, sharing the blessings of our practice. So all of us in the monastery, when uh, we, we practice, we, we've devoted our lives to, to the practice and each day we, we share the blessings of our practice with, with all beings. You know, the good beings, the bad beings, the uh, wonderful beings, the powerful beings, the totally un unpowerful beings, the beings who are really struggling and suffering, the beings who are really successful, and um, just share, share it with everybody, uh, because everybody, everybody needs blessings. And uh, so that's, that's what we do, and that's what you can do too. You know, live your life as carefully and responsibly as you can. Uh, practice meditation in order to develop this understanding and to cultivate wholesome, skillful habits of mind, and then share the blessings uh, with all beings. We also, on a practical level, we have this, uh, we have these wonderful people who live here who understand about uh, computers and IT and how to um, transmit these teachings uh, all over the world. And so we have these Sunday talks, we have meditation classes and workshops and so on. And so this is one very practical uh, way that we can support and advocate for a deeper understanding of Buddha's refuge, um, both locally and globally. So that's very wonderful. This is one of the um, unexpected, fortunate byproducts of the COVID pandemic crisis. Because I doubt it would have taken us a long time to get around to doing this uh, before it. Uh, we would have had a lot of meetings. I've attended quite a few meetings about, you know, whether we um, go on YouTube or to what extent we uh, uh, use social media and there's a lot of discussion, a lot of different views about it and eventually we decided that because of these unprecedented times and because people were experiencing uh, so much uh, difficulty and fear and concern both about their physical well-being and the, and the disease and also about economic pressures and and also for a long time, and it's actually coming back again, the difficulties of being confined to homes, of lockdown measures, that seems such an extreme, extremely difficult uh, predicament for many people that we thought, well, let's just do it. And then, you know, as best we can, find a, a good way of, of, of sharing 
uh, these opportunities with as many people as possible. And then, you know, once things get back to normal, if they ever get back to normal, then we can have a, another meeting about it, whether to continue or whether to uh, adapt our policy. So um, that's quite interesting, just a, a, a benefit uh, that has arisen. And so we can teach all over the world. We don't have to travel anywhere. Um, rather than flying to America or flying to South Africa or New Zealand or Australia. We can just sit here in the temple at Amarawati and um, somebody will switch on a computer and fiddle about with a few things and there we are. Everyone can join in. So just, I think actually this last question is pretty much the same. And how can Amarawati and refuge support right livelihood, especially in times of lack, turmoil, scarcity, especially those trapped in poverty and using food banks to become more financially stable, sustainable and prosperous? So right livelihood is certainly a good thing. Um, in fact, all of the aspects of the path are a good thing. Um, so what Amarawati can do, it can, uh, all of the monks and nuns here can really dedicate their lives to the practice as best they can. They can be very um, honest about difficulties they might be experiencing because it's the difficulties are actually the stuff of our practice. This is a bit of a secret that maybe you're not aware of, but it's the greed, hatred and delusion that arises. It's really like the cutting edge of the practice because it's only through um, observe the, observing these things, uh, meeting them head on, like suffering has to be understood. And we only understand suffering through being with it, being willing to observe it, stay with it, take an interest in it, learn from it, see that it arises from um, uh, wanting things to be different from the way that they are, wanting to get something, wanting to get rid of something, wanting to exist, to be, to be a success, or whatever. Seeing that suffering ceases when we let go of that desire and cultivating the path. This is something that each one of us here can do. So you're asking about how can Amarawati uh, support this? And then we can offer encouragement to people like yourselves to do the same. That's one of the things I love about teaching here. When I teach a retreat here, I just feel so happy that, you know, 50 or 60 people in the shrine room are hearing these teachings, they're applying their, these teachings to their own lives, their own experience, their own greed, hatred and delusion and foolishness, transforming these things into, into strength, into understanding, liberating their hearts, and then taking that liberating understanding out into the world, to their families, their friends, their, wor their workplace, and using their skills, using their, their um, gifts uh, to um, support similar understandings in others. You know, not necessarily standing on a soapbox at Hyde, Hyde Park Corner, you know, telling people the good news, but in, in small ways, you know, many people who come as school teachers or counselors or doctors or I have quite a few musicians who, um, you know, in their own way, they can uh, share their lives, their understanding with, with an enormous number of people. Um, people who write, you know, journalists and so on. There are lots and lots of people come and... So it's, it's a kind of, it's rather a subtle kind of transmission, rather an organic process. But I, I do... Um, I know that it works. I have that, that faith, that confidence. And this is why I'm, I'm living in this way. So I hope that sort of answers all of your questions. And uh, we have a few more minutes. So there are some people sitting here and I'm wondering if any of the people here would like to ask a question or if they've all heard enough for one afternoon. <laughs> But we have about 10 minutes if there's another question. Uh, 
That's usually a very good way of making the mind empty out. Ask a question. Is there a question? Well, I think maybe that's enough for now then. And I'd like to thank all of the people who came to join me in the temple. It's very nice to have a live audience and to thank everybody who tuned in from, from somewhere else. And I really do wish you well. And may these wonderful, beautiful refuges become more and more of a, a reality in your lives um, so that you can live without uh, free from um, all of the things that cause suffering. Just one little little thing that I, I love to share is um, from a chant that we do, may I abide in well-being, in freedom from hostility, no, in freedom from affliction, in freedom from hostility, in freedom from, freedom from ill will, in freedom from anxiety, and may I maintain well-being in myself. And I was surprised when somebody said that they the way they understood that is that, you know, to experience well-being is that people aren't hostile and don't have ill will towards us. So we're saying, please, please don't have hostility or ill will towards me. But my understanding is that may I uh, not have a heart filled with ill will or filled with hostility or filled with anxiety. You know, may, may I learn to recognize these things as they arise, and to transform them. So I keep my heart free from affliction, free from uh, hostility, ill will, free from anxiety. You know, don't worry about things that you don't need to worry about. I tend to use the word concern rather than worry because uh, it's okay to be concerned about things, but I would really suggest that you really contemplate worry and see whether it's really helpful um, mind state and if there's a possible way of transforming it but you'll need to go to the refuge for that you need to observe it anyway i could probably carry on for another hour or two and i think it's probably time to stop so as i said i do wish you well may you live free from affliction free from hostility ill will and anxiety and please maintain well-being in yourselves you